Hello, welcome to the second week of remote sensing training methods and best practices. My name is Anna Prados with the RSET program, and I will be speaking today together with Brock Levins, whom you heard from earlier uh, in this training. So last week, uh, we talked about how to develop a training program mission statement, how to create and perform end user needs assessments, advertising the training, training promotion, and how to create a good presentation. So today is week two, and we will be focusing on on-site or as other people call them, face-to-face -face trainings. And we'll begin by discussing the differences between online versus on-site trainings, then move into the details of on-site trainings, including training levels, the training structure, developing case studies and hands-on exercises, timelines, and finally, program evaluation. Next week, Brock Levins will discuss the specifics of online trainings. So this is a review of the learning objectives, which we also covered last week. So the purpose of this course is to understand the key steps needed for developing online and on-site training, learning how to conduct outreach and promote your trainings, and then how to learning how to develop and deliver effective presentations on remote sensing topics and applications. So last week we also talked about the seven steps to a successful remote sensing training. And we covered steps one through four. And today we'll focus on steps five, six, and seven as they relate to on-site or face-to-face -face training. So we'll talk about developing the training material, conducting the training, and evaluating your training. Next week, we will discuss the three steps again five, six, and seven, but as they relate to online training. So today's topics in more detail are that some of the differences between online and on-site training. On-site trainings, including their structure, how to develop case studies and hands-on exercises, timeline and deliverables for on-site training, and finally, uh, program evaluation. So another review item before we, uh, we, before we get started. So you might remember what a participant is. It's a person or an organization who attends a remote sensing training. An end user is a person who uses remote sensing data or who could potentially be a user of remote sensing data and uses that data to address an environmental problem or question. And this may be a decision maker. Now, a stakeholder, on the other hand, and this is where it can be a little confusing because sometimes the two end user and stakeholder are used interchangeably. A stakeholder is a person who, could, who stands to benefit from remote sensing data or from decisions or actions taken by use of remote sensing data. And of course, a person could be one or two or three of these at one time. All right, so what we're gonna do at this point, this is gonna be the first forum portion of this session today. I'm gonna minimize the slide here and open up a chat box and what we'll do is, uh, if you could share with those online here, um, just a little bit about the re remote sensing topics in which you are teaching or training on. And we'll do this for uh, a few minutes here, uh, get everybody online to share on the different topics. I see a wide range already. And in the lobby, we had a chance to introduce ourselves and our training programs. So 
So please feel free to participate. I think this will be a, a very robust conversation, the more voices we have included. This is your remote sensing training community. So um, I, I encourage you to uh, share with the group. And I do want to point out, with all these forum sessions here, we'll have a couple of these after each topic in which we introduce. We'll open up these forums on each topic and we can share um, with each other. But at the end, we're going to have an open question and answer period. And we're going to bring these forum chat rooms back into play, where if you didn't have a chance to share everything that you wanted to, uh, you'll have another chance to do so. But also, it'll give you a chance to capture, basically copy and paste, all the text that's already in this chat window, and you can copy and paste that to a, a document on, on your personal computer uh, to save, save for future reference on all these topics in which we'll discuss. So I just want to let you know. This is great. I'm seeing a lot of different topics in which we train upon. A lot of water resource management. Here at our set, we, we instruct remote sensing trainings on water resource management, air quality events, land use, land cover change, ecosystem forecasting, disasters, flood management, wildfires. So we kind of are all over the, the spectrum. We like to hit them all using the, the full breadth of uh, of, of NASA data products. So now we're going to talk about online trainings versus on-site trainings. So first of all, there are many forms of online and on-site training available these days. And we can't cover all of them here in this training. So for illustration purposes, I'm going to only discuss the differences between two major types of trainings from the perspective of the RCET program. So the RCET online trainings are generally a series of multi-week webinars, typically three to three to four weeks in length. Uh, RCET most usually delivers this kind of training live, but we also record the training so they can be viewed later uh, on demand. Many organizations only provide the trainings on demand and a few of the RSET basic online courses are, are also available only on demand. But for the most part, they're available both live and on demand. So they include both presentations, they include exercises, homework, generally about two to four exercises of homeworks, homework per webinar series. On the other hand, uh, on-site training, which is what we're talking to today, is held in a computer lab. And it's much longer in duration. It could be two to seven days, it could even be weeks. And it's a mixture of lectures and hands-on activities as well, but there's more emphasis on hands-on activities, as we'll discuss later. And the materials include presentations, instructions, guided instructions for exercises. So how do you know whether to choose an online versus an on-site training? So here are some tips that we've learned through the RSET program that might help you in choosing an online versus an on-site training. So first of all, resources. So there are a lot more resources needed for an on-site training compared to an online training, both for the trainers and the trainees. This is due to the length of the trainings. As I said earlier, an on-site training is going to be longer. And also, obviously, the travel costs, since you need to travel to a physical location in the case of an on-site training. Online training doesn't have any travel costs, since participants 
attend using their own computer from their workplace or from home. Um, in terms of the audience, on-site training is really best suited for about 50 participants or less. However, online training, as is the case with this training that we're offering to you right now, can accommodate anywhere from hundreds to thousands of participants, depending on the type of software you're using. So that's another important difference. However, I should say that when you do on-site training, because you have less people, you know, you have less participants, you can provide to the participants more one-on-one -on -one help, whereas that is not possible with, uh, with an online training where there are hundreds or thousands of participants. So RSET has been successful in teaching both basic and advanced topics for both of these types of trainings, although there are some exceptions, and here's where we get to the content. Some very complex or advanced topics don't, don't, do not work well for webinars or online webinars uh, series. So that is something to keep in mind. So RSET offers training at several levels. And levels here refer to the technical com complexity of the material that's being presented. So something to consider for your own training program is to offer training at different levels. Level zero is for participants that are entirely new to remote sensing. Uh, in the case of RSET, it covers the basics, such as, for example, orbits or types of instruments available for monitoring the Earth. And here we have some examples of uh, existing RSET courses that are level zero. Level one training covers the remote sensing platforms, the sensors, data products, and tools, and other available resources to, for accessing and analyzing the appropriate remote sensing data for a specific application. So they're intended to those that are relatively new to remote sensing. So level zero would be a prerequisite for level one, such as, for example, from the months of remote sensing. And if you've taken an RSET training, you know that in our website, you may have seen that you need a prerequisite of a level zero for the core course that you may have registered for. Level two is the most advanced level of training that RSET offers. And it's more narrowly focused on a topic or more advanced technically. And an example of training topics, you, you, if you browse through our website, you can find many examples of, of these. And they can include training on how to generate a land cover map, estimating water basin budgets, how to track exceptional quality events, or how to run computer code to read satellite data. So an example of a recent RSET level two training is creating and using normalized difference vegetation index, otherwise known as NDVI from satellite imagery. So this level of training is intended for more moderate, for users with more moderate experience. And it, re and it required participation in a level one training from RSET or a comparable training from another organization. So RSET has found this approach of using different levels of training very successful. You can't start a training with a level two. You have to take people through the process of gradual learning. Okay, at this point I wanna sort of gauge the seminar room here. Uh, we're going to pull up a little poll, just kind of see where we are as a group online here. You're going to see a little poll pop up here. Um, you can choose multiple answers. Some people were sharing in the lobby a little bit about the types of trainings that they conduct or plan to conduct.
Looks like we have quite a few on-site and classroom trainings here. That's great. I think in these forum periods in the upcoming topics, there's going to be a lot of information uh, that we would like to gather from you, gather from you and share with the group on your experiences in conducting on-site trainings. I see some uh, don't conduct trainings yet. Quite a few on-site, uh, some online, some both. This is good. Okay, well, we're going to move this on to the next portion here. Uh, that was good. Okay, great. So now we'll get into some of the details of on-site training, otherwise known as face-to-face -face training. So face-to-face -face training is a training at a physical location that has internet access, where ideally each participant has their own computer. And the instructor walks the participants through the processes and analysis needed to use remote sensing data. And as I think we discussed earlier, the ideal number of attendees is between 25 and 50. You don't want to make it too large because then you cannot provide to the participants individualized help. You don't want to make it too small either so that it will enable the training. If it's too small, you cannot do work group and some other things are also not as easy. So the length of the training can be anywhere from days to even weeks. In the case of our set, our on-site trainings are two to three days for level one and about two to seven days for level two. So as I discussed earlier, one of the big differences is the heavy emphasis on the hands-on activities. Ideally, the time of the training is spent with a combination of lectures and hands-on activities and the lectures themselves are less than 50% of the time. In addition, during an um, on-site or face-to-face -face trainings, participants can get that one-on-one -on -one attention that is not possible during an online training where you have hundreds of thousands of participants. So here are some tips and things to consider before conducting an on-site training. The first one is one that we did, was discussed last week, just to conduct an end user needs assessment. You need to have a full understanding of what the participants you intend to reach need in terms of remote sensing. And then you need to ident identify one or more stakeholders who are familiar with the community that you are trying to reach and who can be collaborator, who can collaborate with you in developing this training by defining the agenda and the focus of the training. So stakeholders are very important and they can also be trainers. They can help you. They can be a co-trainer in, in, in not just developing the training, but actually delivering it. And they might also be participants. So the third one is relates to communicating ahead of time three essential items. First are their learning objectives. So participants need to understand what is it they're going to learn and take away from them after the training. The learning prerequisites we just discussed earlier is what level of knowledge or skills do they need prior to the training. So for example, for a level two training, you might require a level one training. Or you might have more specific requirements that work for you. You might have technical competency prerequisites. For example, you might deliver an on-site training that requires participants to know a specific type of software, such as, for example, GIS, or a specific type of analysis. So it's important that participants understand what these prerequisites are well ahead of the training to ensure you'll have a more successful training experience. And just a few more considerations for on-site training. 
So these days, remote sensing training is very popular. So chances are that if you're developing a training, you're going to have more people interested in your training than you have actual space available for you for your training. So for this reason, and also to ensure that your training is successful, it's important to have some clearly defined participant selection criteria and a process for selecting the, the participants. So these criteria are going to be unique to each training program and what the goals of your training program are. Some of the criteria we use include technical competency, which was discussed earlier. And then another very important criteria is do the participants need have a need that can actually be addressed with remote sensing? Sometimes we find that participants expect and think that remote sensing can address a particular problem, and sometimes it can and sometimes it cannot. So that needs to be clear from the, from the start. And those are the type of participants that are going to benefit the most. So it's important not, uh, also not to overwhelm the audience with too much information. And this is, this is the second bullet here. So if you provide too much information by making an agenda that has too many topics, this can overwhelm the participants. And it actually make it more difficult to meet the learned, the learning objectives. So for example, you might have a training focus just on land use, just on flood management, just on air quality monitoring. Those are some examples and how remote sensing can help in these areas. And finally, internet is very important for a lot of the remote sensing training applications because often the data is being accessed, accessed through the internet. So you want to make sure you have a good internet connection, but oftentimes this is not possible. And in that case, you will need to make arrangements to obtain the data so by some other means, such as, for example, by bringing the data with you in a thumb drive or in a flash drive so it can be shared with participants in some other way. The data that you're going to use and analyze Okay, so we're going to open up another forum here. Uh, I encourage you to uh, participate with those online. And if you just want to share with the group, um, in your experience, we have quite a few capacity building programs represented here. A lot of experience online. I think we can learn a lot from each other. So what are some of the most important elements that you've found that leads to a successful in-person training or class? Think about some of the trainings that you have conducted that you felt were very effective. And just some elements on this topic that you felt were crucial to that outcome. For example, certain formats, certain lengths of time that you found to be the best. I see hands-on exercises, definitely. I wholeheartedly agree with that. You got to start working with it. You got to start accessing and applying, uh, really getting down and, 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 and playing with the data, finding the data, getting used to the portals. I see personal application exercises. Uh, that's, I agree, that's very important. Um, and that goes into developing the, the training content with your end user base. Really understanding what their environmental or disaster management questions are and really curtailing your exercises to address those. So their particular location, let's do a, a, a a train or a, an exercise in their region on, on a recent event, possibly.
Okay, so we will bring this back at the end uh, so you can continue sharing. Uh, but in the, interest, in the interest of time, uh, we're going to move on to the next topic, that being uh, training structure. So now on to some more details about on-site training and the training structure. So these are largely based on the experience of the RCEP program and would like to share these with you. We generally begin with a lecture on the satellite missions and instruments and some of the details of how those instruments are capable of monitoring the Earth. This is a topic that you might not need if you already covered it in a prerequisite course but if you didn't, then you will need to cover this early on. The next is to demonstrate the tools and resources for accessing the remote sensing data that you're going to be teaching. After the participants have learned how to access data, you can move on to topics related to anal an analysis of the data and application of the data to an environment question. For example, you might use remote sensing data. You might be teaching how to use remote sensing data to analyze floods or air quality. So you want to alternate lectures with the hands-on activities. This is very important, as I said earlier. Don't spend too much time with lectures. The real learning happens with the hands-on activities. So it's better to be alternating lectures and hands-on activities than, for example, having one entire day with all lectures and another day with all hands and activities. That tends to not be the optimal way to present the material. And if you just think about it, you know, after about an hour or two, we all tend to get tired with a lecture. So you want to apply that to your participants and limit the lecture time, ideally to an hour or less, and then alternate it with discussions and hands on activities. We always include case studies. They can be conducted individually or in groups, and we will, we will discuss these shortly. And then you want to make time for discussion. And you know, unlike online training, face-to-face -face training is a great opportunity to get feedback from, feedback from participants on their training experience, on future training needs, barriers, and other issues that may be preventing them from using remote sensing data. You cannot exchange face-to-face -face interactions with anything else. It is the best means of communication, and you want to take full advantage of that by including some discussion time throughout the So to illustrate some of what I just discussed, here's an example of a training agenda used in a recent air quality course, RSET air quality course. So you can see that it starts with the fundamentals. It does not jump immediately to an advanced topic. Then it moves to data access. This is all on day one. Then it moves to data access exercises. Then it moves to advanced hands and activities. And you notice that on day one, the lectures are no longer than about one hour each. On day one, you may need to do a few lectures one after the other just because you do need to get that introduction to the material in before they can start any of the work. But after that first day, your, your, your agenda should really look more like day two, where you really have pretty much a lecture followed by a hands-on activity or two, then maybe a lecture, then another hands-on activity. And you can see that here in, in, in the day two for this particular one. It's also important to have breaks. And we try to do about three breaks a day. These are long days. And people need to kind of get away for a little while. One in the morning, one at lunch, about an hour lunch, one in the afternoon. And then this is the second day, the third day, excuse me. 
And here's where we have the case studies that I discussed earlier. Although you could bring up the case studies earlier in the agenda also if you want it. We often have one or two early in the, in the training and then one final case study. This is the case study that students do in a group, as a group. And then they present it to the class, they present their results. And that offers a good opportunity for other participants to learn about what each of the groups discovered or found through their case study analysis. And then you notice the very end is a discussion. And you can have the discussion built in at other times of the training, but you want some discussion at some point. Okay, next we're going to talk about some of the details involved in developing hands-on exercises and case studies. So hands-on exercises and case studies are a means to teach the use of web tools or other software for accessing remote sensing data and analyzing the data. You can use these exercises or case studies to introduce a topic, a tool, a data set, or to emphasize a, a particular science or technical concept. Exercises provide step-by-step -step instructions on data access and analysis. Screenshots can be helpful throughout the process. And they really should be written as an operating manual for a user that is completely unfamiliar with the software or data. So in other words, you don't want to assume that the participant of your training knows how to use this particular tool or this particular concept that you're teaching. And you can include questions to help the participants understand use and limitations of the data. The case studies, on the other hand, also use also often called use cases, you may have heard that term, is more gets into the actual application of the remote sensing concept, concepts or skills learned during our remote sensing training to a real world scenario. So in other words, something that has a, a specific event in time and place. You can use pre, both pre-selected studies and case studies that the participants have chosen on their own. So it's usually helpful to begin with some pre-selected case studies where you're walking the participants through that particular question. And then as they become more familiar with the remote sensing data and are more skilled throughout the course of the training, then they can choose some of their own case studies. And the advantage of do, you doing this is that then they can practice what they learned and apply it to their specific problem of interest. So we have found this to be very helpful. And we do the case studies that are chosen by the participants towards the end of the training or a training segment. And then, as I said earlier, they present them at the end of the training to the other participants. They present their findings. So here we have some examples of recently developed RSET exercises in case studies. This one particular one is one that was used in a level two RSET training for flood monitoring and management. You can find these and many others on the RSET webpage. So here's an example of the screenshot I discussed earlier. This is, or it could be an image. So it's basically an image of what their participants should expect to obtain if they've been following the instructions on the exercise. And particularly when you're first introducing concepts, it's, it's, it can be helpful to have some of this included in the actual exercise. You also want questions to help the participants think critically about the exercise. Questions such as, for example, what conclusions can you draw regarding, in this, case, in this case, the flooding detection depth? This will help the participants think more critically about the results they obtained. And the instructions should be very clear. 
don't assume that the participants of your training are, will be familiar with the tool. And here is an example of some very specific instructions about arrows and buttons to click to be able to navigate um, the U and be able to use this web tool. In this following section, we will talk about the timelines and deliverables that can make an on-site, in-person training successful. Certainly, given the many different differences that can exist from one program to another, these timelines can be adjusted, but the next few slides are what we at RSET have found to work in order to ensure a, a smooth process, on-time delivery of training materials, and a good working relationship with stakeholders and participants. We have found that six to 12 months prior to an on-site training allows for enough time to sufficiently plan, produce, and deliver a training that can be tailored to the participants' remote sensing needs. This can begin with the identification of a, of a host institution. For our set, we conduct trainings for certain groups of stakeholders or for a particular community. For certain uh, example, Example, example hosts include such entities as the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency or the International Center for Hydroinformatics. And if you train internally, this could be simply determining who in your organization you will be training or the particular focus of that training. But in essence, uh, this will be a key partner and likely the host location of the training. The roles can be to sponsor, promote, or act as a boundary or stakeholder organization for the community of practitioners, decision makers, or policy makers that you plan to reach. Four to six months prior allows for time to develop a preliminary agenda and to use your or the host network to not only gather interests for participants, but also to promote um, and, and determine the end user needs of the community. Based off those needs, you can begin to identify the remote sensing data sets and tools to instruct upon, determine the specific regional or thematic case studies to develop, and best refine the agenda with the end user community. This would also allow uh, be, be time to reach out to guest speakers if this is a collaborative effort, as well as to advertise through your program promotion methods. And this is to ensure that there be enough interest generated well before the training. You can think of this as a, an iterative process uh, from hearing from the community and developing the agenda, which is why a, a full four to six months is suggested, or at least this is what we have found to be uh, beneficial. Three months prior is a good time to follow up with the agencies, the organizations, the end users and potential participants. Personal contact and verbal communication is often what is needed if email alone did not secure interest. It's also a good idea to have a, a final version of the agenda by this point at about three months. As we get closer to the actual training dates, about two months out, uh, a second round of outreach activities can be used to advertise and reminders can be sent. At this time, trainers should contact the data centers that are hosting the, the tools, the web tools and the data sets that are gonna be covered in the training and the exercises. And this is to ensure that there's gonna be no website maintenance, no planned downtime of the portals or any changes that take place during the actual training dates. One month prior to the training, the final agenda should be posted to your website or to the host institution's website. Some organizations or participants uh, will not actually complete or finalize their travel arrangements unless they see a final agenda and the earlier that can be made available, the better. Registration can also be started at this point to get an idea of those who will actually be attending. This also allows time to have all presentations and exercises completed and sent for editing. If you're translating your materials, it, be sure to give your translators plenty of time here. 
The technical terms used in remote sensing are not always a straightforward translation. And it may take time to refer to scientific literature in those languages in order to be translated correctly. If you intend to conduct a survey after the training, this would be a good time to construct a list of all the tools and the portals that you presented in the various exercises during the training. This that way can be included in the survey ahead of time, and if possible, to give this survey the last day of the training. And this is because those, those portals and tools are very fresh in their minds, and they'll be able to better answer questions as to their perceived utility and their first impressions of those portals. We at RSET have found that about three weeks prior allows for ample time to practice your presentations. This is to identify any gaps or holes in the presentations and to get an idea of the flow between topics. Nothing wrong with extra practice. At this point and leading up to the training, registration can be finalized and the materials can go any sort of final rounds of editing if necessary. And just a little bit on actions post-training. In the weeks following, it should be beneficial to send out a reminder to complete the survey, if one was given. If you keep a database of participants, uh, this is a good time to capture that information. And if you provide a certificate of completion, processing and sending those out earlier rather than later is always appreciated. So once again, this is an example of a timeline that is, this has worked well for us over the years when conducting on-site trainings. Variations will be dependent upon your capacity buildings, capacity building programs focus, your mission statement, and of course. Okay, so on this topic, um, you saw a little bit about what we at RSET do as far as constructing a timeline for in-person, face-to-face trainings. However, um, as I mentioned, not one size fits all. And if there's, I'm sure there's a, a whole host of additional items that you personally add to a timeline as far as making sure the training, the training ends up being successful, all the materials are delivered on time, proper pr promotion has been made, and interest in the training. Um, so if you have a, anything you'd like to share about what additional items that you like to include in your timeline that we didn't particularly discuss, uh, this would be a good time to share it with the group now. Or any additional tips to avoid for an in-person training or class. So we can learn just as much as from our successes in giving trainings as to some of the things that we've noticed either in conducting your own training or in attending somebody else's training. Uh, some things that you found just didn't quite work out or different things that were missing from a timeline that, that you would suggest others to avoid for an in-person training. So we'll give this a couple minutes to, uh, for people to log their answers in. I see something here about providing an overview, um, whether it be in a video or an instruction, um, prior to the, the training itself. That's, that's great. That's sort of getting to the point of making sure everybody is on the same page at the same level so you're able to maybe get past some of the fundamentals of remote sensing if everybody's already versed on the topic and really get into some of the exercises. Thank you. If you have a website for your training or a way to communicate with those who are going to be taking the class, providing the presentations beforehand, uh, people want to do their research or, excuse me, their homework 
before they show up. Uh, great preparation for a really engaged participant. It's a great idea. Thank you. And on the topic of what to avoid, I, I see here having backup screenshots of a maybe a live demo of a website, uh, something that you're going to show them, having backup slides with screenshots available just in case the internet is down or maybe that portal is having maintenance. That is something that we do and I, I definitely encourage anybody who doesn't currently do that to certainly keep that in mind. Uh, we found that to save us on certain trainings because some things are unavoidable but this way you have a little bit more control. So next we're going to talk about program evaluation. So the goal of program evaluation is to assess progress towards meeting learning objectives. In other words, how well is your program doing? Also to assess the impact of the, tra of the training on the training participants. Are the participants making use of what they learn and how? Altogether, the purpose of program evaluation is to provide a means of, improving, of improving, improving the program on an ongoing basis. And there are many different tools for program evaluation. Some of the most common tools are surveys. In fact, we will be asking you to complete a survey at the end of this training. Interviews, focus groups. These tools are also useful for collecting end user needs. And you might recall we talked about end user needs on week one. And I'll refer back to this again later. So back to the tools for program evaluation. RSA uses a survey immediately after the completion of each training. And here you have an example of an RSA survey. And a movie of a participant completing the survey. Many of the questions are multiple choice. Some of them are open ended. Then we have a similar in format survey that we send to the participants six months or, or more after the training. And then finally, we conduct interviews. So the goal of the first survey is to assess if the training met the learning objectives. For example, if you expect the participants to understand how satellite orbits work or the advantages of using rainfall data, then you might include a question specific to those topics. You may also want to assess how well the instructors did. You will have the opportunity to assess how well we did for this training. So you might want to assess how the instructors did in terms of clarity, the pace of the presentation. And you also might want to assess the training format and what the participants thought about the training form format. Was there enough discussion time? Is there enough time for demonstrations? You may also want to gain insight into how useful people found the topics that you taught, the specific data types that you discussed, the satellite missions, or even the software. This could be important for planning your next training. And speaking of the next training, it's never too early to start planning for your next training. So the survey is an opportunity to ask about what future trainings the participants will be interested in. You could give them a choice of future trainings or it could be an open-ended question. It's actually a form of an end user needs assessment. So some quick tips that we've also found to be helpful for using this type of survey. It's best to disseminate it online 
It's faster and easier for the participants and it's easier to analyze the survey data later. In addition to that, you want to make time for the attendees to complete it at the end of the training. Don't, you don't want to send the survey a few days later and do it immediately. Send a few reminders that will help improve the number of participants responding. And don't make the survey too long. Nobody likes long surveys, but you want to make it long enough to make it useful for your purposes. So then there's the second survey. Here's where we assess the impact that the training had on the participants. How did the participants integrate what they learned in their jobs? How did it impact or improve their performance at school, at school or at work? In the case of ARSA, we're specifically looking for the impact on the participant decision support activities. For example, improved ability to assess forest degradation, improved ability to monitor flooding or air quality. However, your program will have other goals. So you will be assessing something different possibly. So we again, so we again ask questions regarding how useful they found specific satellite instruments and data And finally, we also take the opportunity to ask participants if they're still experiencing any barriers or challenges in using remote sensing data, even after the training. This question in particular is very useful for planning your next training. If you find that end users are still struggling with analyzing a certain type of imagery, then maybe you, need, you know you need to spend more time at your next training with that particular topic. So we also have some tips for this type of survey that are similar to some of the tips for the first survey. Disseminate your, your surveys online, send reminders, and don't make them too long. And as you can probably infer from the last two slides, each training program needs to develop their own unique survey to meet their own needs. So the goals of the ARSA program may not be the same as yours, so you will need to ask questions appropriate for your program However, these general guidelines should hopefully be useful for your training program. We also use interviews. So interviews were used early in the RCEP program when we were trying to determine what are some of the key barriers that were preventing people from using, from using remote sensing data. We use this information to help us frame and design the surveys and more, now, more recently, we use surveys to gather more detailed information on how participants benefit from the RSA trainings. Uh, more detailed information than we can get from a survey alone. Here's a quote from a training participant that I interviewed recently. Okay, so let's let's hear from you. Um, do you in your training program or in a classroom setting or actually whether it be online or on site, do you conduct evaluations of your training? Uh, we have a little poll here. Do you conduct formal surveys? Interviews? Other, if you do do other, please use the chat box below to expand upon that. Or if you don't currently evaluate, possibly some of these tips might help you construct an evaluation method for your program. Another thing to think about is do you have a way to assess the impacts of your training? Whether it was successful. Um, a lot of times you need some time to go by for people to begin using the data sets and the portals for their work in order to really see if your training had an impact. So if you have a way 
that your program collects success stories that came about as an outcome of the trainings. I know I would be very interested to hear of those, but I'm sure others on, are on too, because we want to make sure that you know what we do is actually making a difference. So we'll give this a couple minutes for, for everybody to, to chime in. Is there a certain amount of time that you found needs to pass in order to really see if your training has an impact? For instance, if you did a training on wildfire management and you did it before the wildfire season, you likely would have to wait until after the wildfire season or the next two wildfire seasons to really see if the instructions for those practitioners in wildfire management were able to employ the data sets and the tools to make decisions to save, pro save property or lives. So is there a certain amount of time that, that you found would be necessary? I'm sure it depends on the A common online survey format is SurveyMonkey. Does anybody use any other types? We use SurveyMonkey. But if you use some others, that'd be great to, to know of. And we'll give this uh, another 30 seconds, maybe a minute. I see uh, quite a few people still, still, still sharing with the group. So there are seven steps to a successful remote sensing training. So today we talked about steps five, six, and seven, how to develop, conduct, and evaluate your training. Some of the specific topics we covered were the differences and advantages and disadvantages of online training versus on-site or face-to-face -face training. We discussed some of the details of on-site training, including the training structure and how to develop case studies and hands-on exercises, the timeline, and how to conduct program evaluation. Next week, we will talk about online trainings, the training structure, developing assignments and exercises, and the software timelines and deliverables for online trainings. Thank you very much for listening. Um, okay, so this is a little bit more freeform here. 
This is session two of a three-part webinar series. So if you had any questions that came up outside of some of the topics that you'd like to share or ask of us or any other comments on other elements of on-site trainings you'd like to share with the group, we have a great, a great number of remote sensing capacity builders here, please feel free. I thank everybody for sharing in these, in, on these topics that we've covered today as it pertains to on-site, in-person, face-to-face trainings, whether it be for a training program or in an academic setting. I know I am going to capture this wealth of knowledge and, and, and learn from you and hopefully install some of your tips into our future trainings. Thank you. So as Anna mentioned, next week will be the last session of this best practices and methods of remote sensing training seminar or webinar series. Next week we're going to talk about online trainings, webinars, MOOCs, some people use MOOCs, uh, just whatever your vehicle is digitally, virtually to present your on, online trainings. There's a whole host of them. Lots of different softwares, lots of different methods. Do you do it one hour at a time? Do you do six hour blocks? Do you do a series like we do? An hour every week for a few weeks? Are there certain things that you do in between each week? Exercises that they go back and come back to the group with the next week and share uh, so we're going to be really interested to hear how you do that. Um, the internet has made this wide open when it comes to remote sensing training. So um, if this is something that you currently do, I'd love to hear from you. If it's, uh, and, and please attend next week. If it's something that you are looking to expand into, say you only give face-to-face -face trainings, but you realize that sometimes resources aren't always there and an online format might really work out as far as reaching more people. Please uh, attend. I think that we're going to share what we know in our experience. We've been doing about five years now, maybe six years now online. Um, but there's many groups that have been doing it longer. And I think there's going to be a lot of great information for you to, to hear of. So uh, please, next week will be great. I look forward to your attendance. And we will be wrapping up here soon. So if you haven't had a chance to capture everybody's responses, now is a good time to do so. We're going to close this down in about, um, about five minutes or so. I'll give everybody ample time. But we really thank you for attending this week. And please tune in for part three.